This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey folks, before we dive into the interview, let me mention that the Mises Institute's fall fundraising campaign has been running this week. And if you become a sustaining member for just $5 a month, you'll receive a physical copy of Rothbard's Anatomy of the State. The Mises Institute works to spread the ideas of Ludwig von Mises and the scholars he inspired. It promotes peace, private property, and free markets. And because of strict adherence to its principles, it has made no allies on the left or the right. When Lou Rockwell started the Institute, he insisted that the only way to stay true to the ideas of Mises was through honest scholarship and fundraising. Because of him, the Institute has never taken money from corporate sponsors or lobbyists. It's 100% funded through voluntary donations from individuals just like you. So if you care about the important work of the Mises Institute, we hope you'll consider donating and becoming a sustaining member this week. This campaign ends on Sunday, so make sure to visit mises.org slash HH5 now to become a friend of the Institute and get your copy of Anatomy of the State. So again, go to mises.org slash HH5. So HH in the numeral five to become a friend of the Institute and to get your copy of Anatomy of the State. Okay, let's dive into the show. Tom, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Uh, good morning, Bob. How are you? Uh, it's good to be here again. I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so maybe for the benefit, I think most of our listeners know who you are, but can you explain, it's the Gold, Goats, and Guns show right. what what's uh i think people can guess as to what that is but can you unpack that a little bit what, why, why such a catchy title oh uh, why such a catchy title? because i'm nothing but an iconoclast um <laughs> and uh it actually comes from my former uh, publisher over at newsmax uh, christian hill coined the phrase one day and uh he just said i want to do a promotion with tom called gold goats and guns and we never did it but i wrote that down I'm like that's good i like that and i'm gonna I, I kept it in the uh in the toolbox for the future and then when i had to go independent i had to figure out what what i was going to call the thing and it just popped into my head and i i i just know that like i always listen to my instincts and i'm not saying that my instincts are always correct but i <laughs> tend to listen to them and then go from there. So, but gold goats and guns is a metaphor for, um, for income industry and defense, right? We should always have a pool of real savings. If this is the human action podcast. So let's put it in, in necessity in terms, we have the pool of real savings, your income, your, the, your gold. And then from there, you, once you have a pile of that and you have enough savings, then you can go out and go start investing and going concerns and building a better world and all the rest of it. And then of course, if the, once you get to that point, then you should defend it with, guns and the guns are a metaphor for insurance or hedging or whatever mm -hmm. it is that you're doing. So, um, when we put the, you know, for the, for the newsletter, we have a portfolio and the portfolio is designed around those basic ideas. You have like high income stocks in one portfolio, or you have your, you have your big blue chips or whatever in the, in, um, in the, in the, the next portfolio and in the guns portfolio, of course you have your hedges and your, um, what you're doing, you know, to make sure that you're defending the other two portfolio positions. Okay, so it is somewhat metaphorical. So I think people who didn't know you might have thought you meant like literally, hey, we're coming up on Mad Max scenario and you know, well, I mean, it works at that level too. I mean, it, you it know, does, yeah, it does yeah. work. That yeah, yeah, you got to have your garden and yeah, some yeah, chickens yeah, and goats. Got, and, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I'm nothing but an artist. But at the end, a frustrated yeah. artist at the end of the day, Bob. So I'm like, you know, it's like, well, so I'm a writer first, and the metaphor matters. But then, of course, you know, there's that thing above the subtext, which is the text. And well, yeah, we are kind of staring at the potential for you know some very ugly, uh, for a very ugly future, depending on how the things break over the course of the next, you know, I would say 18 months. So since we just sort of dove right into that, why don't we go ahead and just unpack that a little bit? So yes, to the mm. extent that you feel comfortable and you, you know, I know uh, you're going to be speaking at a Mises event uh, where I'll see you in person soon, but just in general, yeah, what, what is your take you, as we're recording this, the Fed recently, it did a 50 basis point cut. How do you feel about things? I, you know, it's funny. Coming into it, I said, look, the most likely thing he's going to do is the first cut will be 25 because, you know, Powell, I mean, he's he's like that. I mean, he he started with 25 basis point raise and then he went to 50, 50 and then said 475s and the whole nine yards, right? And that's what I really thought he was going to do. And I, and I wanted him to do that because I wanted to make sure that he didn't give too much uh, cover for the foreign central banks that have been buying the bejesus out of our 
uh, are out of our debt. And I was looking at the latest uh, TIC report, and it's really clear when you break it down by region that the Europeans and the, you know, like the EU centric portion of the central bank world are have been the biggest buyers of our treasury debt in order to try and maintain credit spreads. Um, between, say, German debt and French debt and Italian debt and, and American debt and UK debt. And, you know, the world is very precariously perched in this kind of very tight currency and credit spread in, uh, regime that is... And so I, what I wanted from Powell was, hey, cut 25 and disappoint the markets a little bit. Let's break this thing wide open and defend American d- domestic markets. We, oh, you know, but that didn't happen. He cut 50 and I said previously, you know, coming into the meeting, I said, well, if he cuts 50, it's because things are far worse than we thought they were. Mm-hmm. And he knows that they're worse. And then he went up to the podium and he said, well, the economy's solid and inflation is low, but I'm cutting 50 anyway. Well, you know, it's like, you know, it's like shooting, man. You can't have those, those three things don't compute, right? It's like in shooting, you've got pressure, velocity, and accuracy. You can pick two. <laughs> you can have any two at any one time. It's, a, you know, three legs of a triangle. Um, it's the same kind of thing with what he put up on the, uh, uh, on the. Well, well, yeah, just to, uh, uh, to double click on that, that, that's, yeah. that was one of my reactions too, is to say in a vacuum without knowing anything, if all you had to work with was the official unemployment rate, the official CPI inflation rate, and the Fed's policy, like this is not, you know, right now CPI inflation is still above target. Unemployment is right. not high by historical standards. You know, there's mm-hmm. plenty of different presidential administrations with the current unemployment rate. They'd be like, hey, look at this. Mm-hmm. And so that it's weird that he's cutting 50 basis points in that right. scenario. So clearly that shows there must be something else going on. So I don't know if you want to just. Yeah, no, he, I think he, I think something is spooking him. I, like, remember, I, I, you know, I am a, I, I, I am a good Austrian. I only listen to what people do as opposed to what they say. Mm-hmm. Um, and central planners generally, when they're speaking, are lying. And while I have sympathy for Powell much more than you know, your standard Aust- you know, Austro libertarian, and um, uh, at the same time, I also know that he, you know he is a central planner and he is a Keynesian at heart, and yada yada yada. Um, so I assume that he's lying here and there, but sometimes he's telling you like the, the God's honest truth. Like when he says, you know, y- y'all need to fix the fiscal problem like Capitol Hill. We can only do so much at the Fed. He's not wrong. And, you know, mm-hmm. that's a that's a marked uh, shift in narrative and from a Fed chairman who's never said anything like that before. He's never commented on fiscal the fiscal side of things, even when he wanted to. Doesn't matter who the or he or she wanted to, no matter who they were. Uh, Powell's been quite clear while Ray, uh, while he's been on his hire for longer shtick that, you know, y'all need to get your, you need to get your, your house in order. But at the same time, he also needs to get rid of this offshore Euro dollar put that's under the market. And, you know, I'm at this point, you know, people know that I'm the SOFR versus LIBOR guy. And that I understand that I believe that SOFR, that SOFR, the secured overnight financing rate cut the cord, you know, the, the physical cord between um, European markets or even Hong Kong markets and um, and American markets. And I think that's where we are. And Powell was caught uh, between a rock and a hard place. You've got inflation is still a little high and he knows it and he knows it's on the horizon. He knows it's coming back and he's got a tight credit market and the you know, failing commercial real estate and, and everything else. And he can't, he has to like choose one versus the other. So I think he chose the labor market over the inflation over inflation. I think that's what he did in, in that. And then there's also, look, he works for the banks at the end of the day. I've never been, I've never, never said anything. Otherwise he works for the banks. The banks must be in a little bit more trouble than we think they are. And therefore that's what's going. What's really interesting though, Bob, is that I, 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 what I wanted out of the 25 basis point cut was the return to the bear steepener trade on the yield curve. Right, the do we see the long end of the bond curve uh, sell off, and we see a rise in the ten year and the thirty year and all that? But I didn't think we were going to get that with fifty. Well, I was wrong, and we got it with fifty. So things are actually worse than mm-hmm. <laughs> than they they perceived to be because the minute he cut fifty, the market went, "Oh my God, things are really bad." And then they and the, the long end of the curve started selling off. And I can tell you, just watching the intraday markets and like watching the German Bund and watching U.S. Treasuries and and, and all these and, and and all the credit spreads and whatnot, they're moving heaven and earth right now, man, to keep these spreads from collapsing. I mean, when I see Christine Lagarde go on, you know, the court jester show, the John Stewart's 
The Daily Show to try and sell herself to a bunch of Democratic normies, uh, that's a huge tell that they're in trouble. Like, like, what is Christine Lagarde doing on The Daily Show? I mean, I hate to, like, like put it in those terms, like, this is supposed to be, a, you know, we're supposed to, like, mm-hmm. get all serious and talk about serious capital markets, but you got to watch the people and what moves they make to understand politically what's happening, because those are tells. Yeah, that, in, in another conversation I had with you, yeah, you said, what was it? So, like, it's personnel over policy or something like that? Personnel or, is policy. Yeah, yeah. So, and I thought you were, especially in the current environment mm-hmm. where they have the ability to do so much in principle that, yeah, it's mm-hmm. you can study the fundamentals all day long, but if they come in and do something crazy, that's going to upset your calculations. So Right, we, you, have you, Janet, you, we, have, we have Janet Yellen at, at Treasury, for example, doing yield curve control again because she loved doing it so much when she was Fed chairman. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, no, nothing changes like they, they they go to the same toolbox all the time. So, you know, and Powell has always been a hawk and always and always hated QE going back to when, you know, he was a junior member and Bernanke started the he created the two percent fl- inflation target out of whole cloth, presented it to the to the to the Fed. And everybody's like, where did this come from? Well, I tell you where it came from. It came from freaking Davos. We know where it came from. We know where these things came from. And then they just implemented policy and they kept selling us on this idea over and over and over again. And Lagarde, actually, when she was on with the Daily on the Daily Show, I only watched the first five minutes before I started, you know, throwing up a little bit in my mouth because I just can't <laughs> do this. Um, she said, you know, well, 2% inflation is the kind of inflation that you don't really feel. You know, it it it, it happens, but it's a kind of healthy happening. I'm like, oh, oh the, you know, so no, you're just telling us that you like stealing 2% of our wealth every year. Compounded over time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about no? <laughs> like yeah. The natural state of affairs is deflation. We don't need 2% inflation to offset the natural state of a free market being in deflation. What we just need is zero. Okay. If you, okay, if you guys need to. As you know, Tom, that in, among academic economists, like if you go read their, you know, their, their white papers or the presentations they do at the Jackson Hole conference and stuff. Mm-hmm. They've somehow made it so that the very phrase price stability means 2% CPI inflation. That's right. what they that's the definition of what it means for prices to be stable is when they increase 2% a year. Like what? That doesn't sound like stable. No, it's, 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 it's gross. Yeah, when you really stop to listen to what these people are and what they're saying is that we need that in order to be able to maintain our process of by which we're going to continue to dominate markets. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, like, I don't, you know, this is where I, you know, this is where I'm going to, you know, I say, this is where I say mean things about Powell. I think Powell, you know, in effect buys into this, or at least he has no other option than to buy into this at this point, because things were so bad and things are, and the structure of production is so awful and the malinvestment is so awful and everything else. And so because of that, like, no matter how much you want to be a, like a normal person and, you know, allow for prices to maintain some level of stability, you know, while arbitrage and, and innovation grinds out uh, profit um, and uh, makes capital more efficient, which is basically what deflation is, that, that, that kind of deflation is, like, like, you know, he can't even do that if he wanted to because things are so freaking, you know, cocked up. So mm-hmm. let me you know, circle you back. That. You said something a few moments ago about, hey, everyone knows I'm the SOFA versus LIBOR guy. Can you explain what those acronyms are and then just sure, sure. unpack that a little bit just for people fair, who fair that, they're not I, in the I, trenches I, I, on that? Yeah, yeah no, I, fair enough. I, I, I tend to like you know, try and <laughs> tighten, <laughs> give out too much information all at once and, and do the thing. So SOFA, the so- Secured Overnight Financing Rate, um, is the new debt indexing rate for the United States. Well, for now, effectively, for dollar markets around the world. Previous to that, we had LIBOR, the lender interbank offer rate. Now, that was set by 18 City of London banks and, well, 17 City of London banks and J.P. Morgan's London office, so basically the City of London. So there's a difference between those two things and that and, and those two rates and, and, and who they serve, Right. One serves the pricing that's needed by the offshore dollar markets, the euro dollar markets, while the other is, and so far, is is a reflection of the situation in real, honest-to-God repo markets here in the United States. It's based on real, honest-to-God transactions in the repo markets. This is what the the world, this is what our, our, our markets are pricing dollars at. 
what that means is that we actually, for the first time in our lifetimes, have a uh, a dollar system that is de- that it's is based on what the the domestic demand for capital is in the United States, as opposed to what the uh, what the offshore dollar markets wants, what the global market for dollar wants. Um, so let's go through a scenario here where I try to explain, unpack the difference in real terms of what this actually means, because none of this, all this sounds great, but okay, what does it actually mean? Well, think of it this way. Every time the Fed goes on a hiking cycle or an easing cycle or a lowering cycle, right, you, the, the Fed is trying to set the domestic um, Fed funds rate based on what it's seeing in the domestic economy, right? Mm-hmm. And so say, the and the if the United States economy, let's assume, is stronger than the rest of the world, then we can handle a much higher rate for a longer period of time than everybody else and higher cost of dollars. But if all the debt that's out there is indexed to LIBOR, then if when the Fed hikes rates, say to 5% or 4%, and goes up 300 basis points, invariably, that's going to put more pressure on offshore banks and the offshore banking system, what what we like to call the shadow banking system, than um, what's happening in in the United States. So therefore, what will happen? Well, LIBOR will blow out to the upside. People will go, once once, their loans start to deteriorate and people can't service them and everything else, and they're getting hit harder by the rise in the cost of credit. So therefore, what will happen? LIBOR will blow out because then people will need dollars desperately. They'll go and they'll bid and they'll bid up LIBOR. And so say the Fed funds rates at four and a half percent and LIBOR starts to blow out to five percent or or five and a half percent or six percent, that has a spillover effect back to the United States because our debt is also indexed to LIBOR. So your your um your adjustable rate mortgages, your car, your new car loan originations, you know, all that stuff, credit revolvers for companies, all that stuff's based on was was based on LIBOR. So while the European banks were getting themselves into trouble, they were having a disproportionate effect of forcing a slowdown in the United States well beyond what our capacity was. And so when invariably the short the, the TLDR is the Fed would always start cutting rates after a rate hike cycle earlier than they needed to to clear the malinvestment mm-hmm. from the previous cycle. Why? Because the Euro dollar markets wanted were levering up and and doing thing and and playing with our dollars, which we were sending them on the cheap thanks to deficit spending. Right? So Cut that link, and now all of a sudden, LIBOR can blow out to the upside, and we don't care. Well, LIBOR doesn't exist anymore. In seven days, it stops It stops even being quoted, right? In the SOFR markets, what you have is, well, you're going to have an expression of how SOFR is trading is based on what, what's happening in the U.S. domestic markets. It doesn't matter what's happening in, you know, but it doesn't matter if Barclays or Credit Suisse or, you know, ING or Intesa San Paulo are getting, or they're in trouble or Santander or any of these people. We don't care. JP Morgan's fine. Our, our local credit unions are okay. All right. And they're just buying money as they need to. And, and, and so we, if we don't see any stress in the sofa markets, but we're seeing stress overseas, then, um, then, that, then the cord's been cut. And what I would argue is that the prima facie evidence of this effect, because SOFR went into effect for all new debt origination in the United States, uh, was indexed to SOFR as of January 1st, 2022. Mm-hmm. Notice Powell starts hiking rates in March. By July, Lagarde has to respond by managing credit spreads, openly creating a new instrument to manage credit spreads between sovereign debt. And, the, and also remember that in, uh, in Europe versus the United States, they have a lot more bank debt. Then they do, we issue a lot more corporate debt. So Apple, when they want to raise capital, they issue corporate paper. Well, and, you know, when Volkswagen wants to raise capital, they go to a German bank, they go to the Commerce Bank, and they go for a loan. And so the banks there, there's far more um, bank debt. So therefore, the, um, the, 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 the benchmark lending rates in Europe and the, are far more important to them than they are, than it is here in the United States, because we have a different because capital is priced differently depending on its application. Uh, it's mm-hmm. mo- we're much more flexible in the way we, we, we finance 
expansions. So, and that's why we can afford, that's why in March of 2022 or the late 2021, 2022, everybody was like, well, Powell will raise to 1%. And then he'll have to like, you know, then it'll be like Puxatani Phil, he'll see a shadow and there'll be six more years of QE. Uh, I'm like, yeah, no, this Sofer thing is a big deal. And I think he can go higher than that. I think he needs to go higher than that as a good Austrian. I'm like, no, he needs to go, he needs to bring out, he needs to do what needs to be done. He needs to get rid of all the stimulus money from the, the CARES Act. He needs to bring out the leverage and everything else. So what I said was, well, he should go to 6%. And everybody's like, yeah, he'll never get there. I'm like, well, we'll see. And then he and he goes to five and a half, mm-hmm. and he's able to hold it there for over a year. And meanwhile, overseas, everybody's screaming. And they, every couple of months, every couple of meetings, you'll you would see a massive political campaign to force Powell to pivot. You'd see a massive move in the bond markets to try and force him off of that. You saw it last December. You saw it. You saw it coming into this meeting. You saw it in June. You saw it during the um, during the debt ceiling crisis of March of 2023, and he hiked rates by 25% by 25 basis points in the middle of the worst banking crisis since Lehman Brothers. Like, how much more data do you need that we can handle this? And to be honest with you, I think that those were that those banks were executed. As because they were offshore dollar funding sources for nefarious purposes, for very nefarious political purposes. Um, that's what I that that's been my forensic uh, the look into that stuff told me, and that we have, and all of those banks were regulated by the San Francisco Fed versus the New York Fed, and they were all bought by members regulated by the New York Fed. Are, so are you was, talking about like a, Silicon Valley Bank and such yeah. when you're talking about Silicon okay. Valley Bank, Signature mm-hmm. Bank, um, uh, and the other one, Silvergate, they were all San Francisco based, effectively like oligarch banks. They're the ones like giving Mark Zuckerberg a, a 1% loan against his Facebook shares, right? They were the ones laundering back our, the, uh, the, the money that went through all the family office, all of George Soros's family offices and whatnot. And it came back into those banks. And then he was using that to buy DAs and rig elections and all the rest of that stuff. All the stuff that we 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 watch on a day-to-day basis, that always has to be paid for. And guess what? It's paid for with money, with our tax money that we send overseas. They lever up and then they send back to us to 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 attack us with. And I just like systematically over like three years, I watched the Fed in my mind execute like a whole bunch of stable coins, like FTX and all the others, and they left Tether and they and they and they, and they killed all the other ones. And then some of these oligarch banks that were all managed by Mary Daly over at the San Francisco Fed. Now, the San Francisco Fed is who's bailiwick? Janet Yellen's. Janet Yellen was first the president of the San Francisco Fed. She created all the internal structures existing within the San Francisco Fed, then turned it over to her protege, Mary Daly, when she became uh, FOMC chair, extending Bernanke's QE and, and yield curve control for far longer than it needed to. And then she becomes treasury secretary under Obama and Biden. Like this is all like, this is all politics folks. This is all a policy. This is all personnel. And Powell is, you know, represents, you know, old New York private equity. Okay. So, so I'm not surprised that we have a be- massive, we mm-hmm. have a massive shift in policy. Okay. So just to be, understand your uh, theory, you're saying there was a power struggle in a sense within the banking system and that the New York wing was hitting the Western coast wing and that that was not something Yellen would have approved of, but she was a treasury. So she couldn't stop it. Is that. Yeah. And and she couldn't stop it. One. Well, she tried to undermine it as best as possible. What does she do? She helped Lagarde do yield curve control by issuing bills as opposed to longer term debt with an inverted yield curve. The woman issued six month treasury bills. Like they were going out of style in two years. When she's got a she's got a she's got a historic inversion on the two ten spread, right? Mm-hmm. Hundred basis points on the two ten spread, and she's issuing two years, as opposed to tens to to finance the the Biden administration's profligate spending, right? Okay. Let me just um, make sure if people get that, what you're saying. That's not so, incompetence. That's poli- That's not incompetence. Yeah. That's so vandalism. Folks, what Tom is saying there is that you know the, the federal government's spending more than it takes in a tax receipt, so it's got to borrow money, mm-hmm. and that he's mm-hmm. saying we have had in recent years in a, in a strong inversion of the yield curve, meaning short rates are higher than long rates. In particular, the two-year yield was higher than the 10-year. So if you're mm-hmm. the federal government borrowing money, why would you borrow 
having to pay back in two years if it's you're being charged more at an annualized rate than to borrow and have to pay back at 10 years. That doesn't make any sense. And yet that's what she was doing, like very at an unusual rate, like, you know, that like the amount she was borrowing, yeah, at the on the short end was a lot higher than historically would be the norm, even adjusting for the overall size of the deficit. Right. Oh, well, the, the the point is, is that what she was, it, it doesn't make any sense, Bob, if, you know, you think that Janet Yellen works in the best interest of America. If you think that Janet, if you, if you, you know, assume that Janet Yellen is a traitor, and I have no problem calling Janet Yellen a traitor. Uh, if you assume that she's a traitor working for other purposes, other actors, foreign actors, then it all tracks and makes a lot more sense. And so I'm just like, I'm just like, looking at the data and looking at the actions of what these people do, their human action, we're on the human action podcast. So look at their actions and what are their actions telling you? Their actions are telling you that they work for, you know, offshore banking interest, interest or offshore political interests. They work for these evil, I, my, my evil globalists, you know, that I like to call Davos, um, mm -hmm. who have a particular agenda. And that particular agenda also, you know, feeds back into the, their agenda is central bank digital currencies, the end of the two tier transmission system for monetary policy to, to cut the commercial banks out of the pro, the process of, you know, issuing new money and new credit. They just want to go directly from the central bank to your iPhone, cutting out JP Morgan, cutting out Goldman Sachs, cutting out, you know, everyone cutting out your credit unions and everyone else. They don't need to exist anymore. When you listen to these people talk and you think about what they're talking about doing, it's very clear they have no interest in having a commercial banking system. So this is an ideological fight between the private versus public formation of capital, regardless of whether it's regulated or unregulated. I mean, we have our, we, you know, we have our our ideal, our 100% free banking system with 100% reserve, you know, 100% reserve lending and all the rest of it. We have our ideal and we should hold to that ideal. I believe in that ideal. But then we have the world that we live in. <laughs> and that world is not that. Well, you know, that world is, you know, 8% covers and, you know, and it almost, you know, 20 times leverage and all the rest of it. So now the question is, you know, if they want to do away with the commercial banks, why would the commercial banks go along with this? And why would the Federal Reserve, who works for those banks, supposedly, why would they in institute policy that would do that? Well, I can tell you that like under the Obama administration, under Geithner and Yellen and Bernanke, like, the banks were not, you know, they, they were on their back foot, as far as I, I could tell. And it was the minute Trump got elected, handed, you know, and he was, and then he, and then he was handed Powell. He's like complained about this. He's like, whoever handed me this guy, Powell, like, I just want you know, during COVID, he was screaming about it because Trump likes low interest rates, but Powell was trying to, you know, they went on a, on a mission. They saw their opportunity as a mission to change, fundamentally change the way dollars are priced around the world and re re regain Fed control or Fed sovereignty over monetary policy. Now, we can sit here and we can argue all day long as to whether or not the Fed should exist, but the Fed does exist. And if the Fed's going to exist, wouldn't it be better that the Fed serve American interests as opposed to global interests? I, th I would think so. And um, because everything we've complained about and everything that we argue and, and, and is the impetus for all of our, our, our criticisms, which are all fine, I have no problem with any of the criticisms of these, these systems, is that they're all predicated on this idea that, that the central bank works for the globalists, you know, and, and it's just been the implementer of that policy. Well, what happens, what does it look like if you get a guy running the fed with the programs put in place and the guardrails put in place? And I can go into like, you know, why did he in June do one thing of 2021, do one thing to drain dollar liquidity. And then the very next meeting turns around and says, well, yeah, um, the foreign central banks can only come to the Fed to get repos <laughs> and you're going to pay Fed funds for it or you're going to pay above Fed funds for it or whatever. So like it was like controlling, like it was very clear that what I was seeing was that this was a, this was a Fed that was now trying to bring back monetary policy onshore and then let the world hang and, and, but do it slowly and do it gently. And, uh, 
you know, because this is a very big ship that needs to be turned because, you know, it's again, it's like everything else. You, you, you want to break as little as possible. And ultimately, because they serve the New York banks, then the New York banks, they want people to lend. They want things to lend to. Right? I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it again. Jamie Dimon doesn't care whether he builds a, whether he, whether a pipeline gets built in Nebraska or Siberia. He just wants to be able to finance it. Right? He doesn't care. He don't care where, where it is. Like he will move the capital and go to where the the opportunities lie, even if it works against his personal proclivities, because his job is to his shareholders to J.P. Morgan. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't think Diamond is agenda driven beyond he's vaguely a patriot and he just wants to you know do do business. So why can't we build pipelines in the United States and why can't J.P. Morgan be you know finance them? What's wrong with that? That mm. was verboten, and certainly verboten under Bern- uh, under Obama and now Biden. Right. Whereas you know, under Trump, it was exactly the opposite. Right. Mm. So, like when you stop to really look at like how the policy on Capitol Hill is form uh, for, is, is, is shaped, along with the monetary policy, like it's a very clear. There's a very clear dichotomy between the those two like schools of thought and the personnel implementing them. Do you, how relevant do you think it is? Um, just the difference, the Powell coming, like he's not an academic, right? And he's no. coming like he was a, a New York City investment banker. And yeah. so that kind of that dovetails or, or fits your, your narrative, right? That Powell is sure. not this, you know, sort of cosmopolitan member of the global elite that is above petty national concerns. No, he's like his buddies are the investment right. bankers the in New York. Group. Yeah. Right. And, and not, of course, that that means he's a great guy, <laughs> but just yeah. in terms of looking at yeah. it like, you know, the different mob families facing off against each other and they just have their sure. interests don't totally overlap. No, they don't. And and we should and we should always and, and, you know, you know, we should look at these people as per their incentives. Right. It's in the commercial banks is Wall Street, for lack of a better term. It's in Wall Street's best interest to stop Klaus Schwab who is also a figurehead for a larger quote unquote conspiracy or whatever you want to call it. He fronts Schwab and company front for a particular group of people. We have commercial banks. If you're, if those people who are pretty freaking powerful because of what they have, it's clear what they've done. Like go look at what they implemented under COVID and how much power they have at, 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 at the point that they've accumulated at the political level and everything else. Oh, by the way, all done with our money post-World War II, right? Um, when you look at those people and they say, okay, well, I, I need somebody to fight these people. I can't fight them. I got like, you know, I got like, I got 500 bucks in the bank for Christ's sake. What, what am I, how am I going to fight these people? By like screaming at them and, and lobbing pebbles at them? No, I need to, uh, I need to recruit somebody who has equivalent levels of power and the incentive to fight them. And when I do that Venn diagram, the only group that I can come up with is the New York banks. Once the New York banks are on, bo- on, on board with that idea, then you can get parts of the military industrial complex. Then you can get other, uh, other, other groups and they'll start to turn. In similar analysis of, let's like, just think of it this way. In geopolitics, we watched the United States empire as the inheritor of the British Empire, run roughshod over the world up until about 2014. And then Putin and Russia said that Syria is the red line. We're done. You, 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 you get to move all the way to Syria and Ukraine. That's it. And mm-hmm. he intervened in the Donbass civil, um, civil war and or war to prevent Donbass secession, similar to the United States in, in the 1860s. And he intervened in the, the, the partitioning and the destruction of Syria. And what did he do? What did he set in motion when he did that? Well, when he didn't, when Russia didn't get, when Russia won, they got Crimea, they stabilized the Donbass, and they pushed Al-Qaeda and, you know, ISIS out of most of Syria and pushed all those, NA- those NATO-backed troops and, and terrorists out of those areas and stabilized the Assad regime. What did he do? Well, interestingly enough, now the Saudis are his friends, not ours. Now he's a member of OPEC as opposed to being on the outside 
being always effectively predated by OPEC in their alliance with the United States, right? So when the board shifts, people's incentives shift, like cartels break, you know, old relationships break and new incentives are replaced with, you know, replace old incentives and you get alliance shifting because everybody at the end of the day will act according to their best interests if, um, and they will always act in the, you know, in accordance with the law of diminishing marginal utility. Like there comes a point where there's a diminishing marginal utility to being a friend of the United States if you're the Saudis and mm -hmm. Russia presents a better opportunity for them. When you start to do the entire analysis of, of Saudi Arabia, we, right. And so it, that's what happened. And the same thing's happening, I think, within the United States. You've got, a, and, and to a lesser extent in, in Europe, but certainly within the U.S., where you have a bunch of different factions who mapped to different, you know, to, to, to different quote-unquote globalists, be it the British remnant or Davos, which are different, and all this other stuff. And then you have the people who are like, well, we can't fight them right now. They're in charge of everything. So you go along to get along. You survive as best as possible. Like we all do on a regular basis as these people predate us, right? As they steal all our money and, you know, mind virus our kids and all the rest of it. We do our best. We do mm -hmm. our best to maintain ourselves and our capital until an opportunity presents itself. And then when the opportunity presents itself, you strike. And if you win a battle, it makes it easier to win the next battle and to get somebody else to come to your side. Because all of a sudden everybody goes, oh my God, we can win. And the psychology changes. And once the psychology starts to change, then everything starts to break down. And I think that's where we are right now is that psychologically we're in this like really unsettled state. Like everybody's trying to figure out who's going to win. Mm -hmm. and, but now we can talk about the election if you like. <laughs> well, just be, I, I do want to get into that, but can you sure. just to piggyback on you know, this, this idea that I think is intriguing. That's why partly why I wanted to have you on here is Ooh, that you're not just, sure. oh yeah, it's the, the little guy and the, you know, the, the honest salt of the earth man versus all the bankers around the world that you were saying, no, there's different factions. And you said something sure. in a previous discussion you and I had that was not mm. on my radar about Basel three and how mm. that actually, I guess what right. it gives an advantage to the European banks vis-a-vis -vis the New York ones. And can you just give the, a, a preview of that? Sure. And, 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 and I am not an expert on the Basel three. What I'll say is the following. Um, and I, and I know you asked me to, to talk about this before we, uh, we, you know, when we were, uh, doing the, the the preliminary on this one. So I went ahead and reminded myself what the problem is. I, I, I urge everybody, go read Jamie Dimon's comments about Basel III. I think they're very indicative of what the problem is. I've always felt, and this, and this fits with my view of the world, which is Europe is very uncompetitive at the global economic level. They don't have any collateral, folks. They don't have any oil. They don't have any gas. They don't, they barely have any coal. They don't have any collateral to under, to, to collateralize the debt that they want to, you know, issue in order to, you know, fund their governments and fund the whole thing. We have plenty. The Russians have tons. The Asia's got a, 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 a unbelievable amount. And by the way, so does the UK, FYI. They got still have plenty of oil and gas off the, off the shores of Scotland. Um, but your proper doesn't have any. And so because they don't have any collateral, they need to bring everybody else down to their level of efficiency or their level of collateral. And that's what all the rules and regulations and everything else are. That's why we have cafe standards on cars and, and nobody else does. So Basel three is yet another regulatory scheme to normalize like the, all the OECD rules on like corporate, they, 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 they keep trying to uh, put forth that everybody should have the same corporate tax rate and the same this and the same mm -hmm. that. Well, it's all the same normalization. And we should have standardized rates and all these mm -hmm. things. Like, no, we shouldn't. Like, standardized rates are how we, well, I, 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 it, standardized rates are how a, how one group predates another group by altering the cost of capital to their advantage against somebody else. Like, the, the superpower here at the end of the day, folks, is that the British, I think, were the first ones to figure out, maybe the Italian, maybe the Venetians first, but certainly the British did the best imp long-term implementation of this, is understanding that you can, that if you can manipulate currency arbitrage to your advantage, you can 
radically destabilize and and eventually destroy your the 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 government or the 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 community structure of that place that you want to go take over next right and that's the in effect the color of the color revolution model and the british are you go back 300 years and you'll see this everywhere they're masters of currency arbitrage so basel three is another version of this where the american banks are going to have to have their um their reserve requirements raised in a way that is disadvantageous to them versus Europe because of their interconnectedness and because of the way they do business. The way the Basel III rules work, or the way the current version of the Basel III rules work, it disadvantages investment bankers and, and, and non non net interest margin traditional banks. Those get have you know have effectively lower costs of capital. So you're going to be uh, or lower reserve requirements under the the new Basel III endgame rules, and that's what Jamie Dimon's screaming about is that our investment banking process, our investment banking divisions are going to be subject to massively higher reserve requirements and then, you know, Commerce Bank, who just, you know, sends, you know, issues a loan to Volkswagen to go build a plant. It's a fundamentally different, um, it's a very fundamental, they have fundamentally different business models. And then a one size, as always, a one size government fits all model is going to pick winners and losers. To put it in like mm-hmm. really kind of simple, right, right. Um, you know, in, in in terms that you know this audience would understand, like mm-hmm. right, and and to to put to break it down to the TLDR, that's what they're talking about. And okay. Powell is absolutely not going to go along with that. The, the last thing we heard out of Powell was that there will be substantial revisions to the Basel Three Endgame rules, and that makes perfect sense because he works for the major New York City money, 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 major New York money center banks who are all the shareholders of the New York Federal Reserve, which is yeah. the most powerful of the 12 member banks, right? Okay. regional banks. Okay. Um, I think the other euphemism is harmonization. How could you mm. be against harmony? You know, like we got to have tax harmonization, make sure, you know, yes. there's, there's oh, nowhere on horrible. earth you can go. <laughs> No, it's horrible tax harmonization. Like, like how I, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to keep it clean and not just like you know start like dropping f bombs everywhere because it just it's so infuriates me when I hear stuff like that because it's so complete. It's such complete gaslighting. It's so awful. So yeah, no, no. Guys. Okay, well, it's- let's yeah, let's pivot. You you teased us. So yes, we want to hear what does Tom Longo think about the upcoming election? Is it? Is there really a difference? Is there the deep states behind both? What the heck's going on with these assassination attempts? What do you want to pontificate on? What is going on? Sure. This is a um, crazy election. It is. And I, I'm half tempted to to, to uh, agree completely with Martin Armstrong that this may be the last election we ever have. I, I, I've been, the, privately, I've been you know preparing for the breakup of the United States into anywhere from three to seven countries since, I don't know, 2004. Mm-hmm. Personally, like you know, in my head, like one day I think I built a house out in the middle of North Florida, like you know, a homestead. I started doing the homesteading thing back in two thousand four. Um, turned out that I'm a really bad goat farmer, by the way. So, um, uh, I'm shocked to hear that. Um, there is a fundamental difference between Trump and Kamala Harris. Trump is not perfect. Trump is far from perfect. Trump is also seventy eight. And you'll note that he's putting around him a team of people who are the next generation. Unlike the next generation that the Democrats are offering us in Kamala Harris, who is just more of what we've already seen, which is, oh, we believe we're going to say X, but we really are going to do not X. And I'm not even going to say mm-hmm. Y, but not X, right? You know, Obama was hope and change, and yet he became drone striker in chief, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, like this is this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with very sinister people who, if they can't get their cookie, are going to try and get us into a war. They are working on that as you and I are speaking. Every every like we're doing this for an hour. In that time, Israel could like start another, like, bomb another, you know, facility, Hezbollah facility or blow people up with pagers or whatever, or, you know, the Ukrainians could strike another Russian ammo depot. These escalations are strategic, but they're strategic because again, like I said earlier, they are worried they're going to lose. Um, my friend, Alex Craner, who I absolutely, 
you, you met when we did the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the taping that we did, um, is now doing, has done some unbelievable work to figure out, to, to, and, you know, kind of leaps of intuition and just how close to bankruptcy the Bank of England actually is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they need a cover story. And that cover story is, you know, we need to have war with, we need to have the United States come in and bail us out from the mistakes that we made by lending money to Ukraine, no different than what they did when they lent money to fight a war against Germany in World War I. And then we got um, Woodrow Wilson to come in. No, her, yeah, Herbert Hoover. Her, I always get yeah, Woodrow Wilson. I always get those two confused for some reason. Um, Wilson to come in and fight, clean up their mess at the end of World War I and tip the scales in their favor so that they can then punish Germany for what for everything. And that story is far more complicated than that. And we could do two hours on just, you know, the British perfidy across multiple um, uh, multiple axes of warfare within World War I. But this, but the general playbook is still the same. Get get themselves involved in the war they can't win. Get the United States to come in and finish the job for them, and then force reparations on Russia to pay them back to pay back, you know, the loans. And that's you know that's what they're trying to do. And at the same time, they also know that the existing system needs to be collapsed so they can get rid of the central they get rid of the commercial banks go for central bank digital currencies and everything else and issue a new euro and a new pound and everything else and then default on the debt at the same time but still demand and then and then demand reparations from Russia to capitalize collateralize that new system after they've stiffed all the bondholders of the existing 15 20 trillion dollars worth of debt or whatever the hell they have and it's monstrous and it's disgusting, and it's what they're doing. And okay, so they don't care how they get that war started. That's what they need to do. So let me ask you this. I mean, you said a lot there. Let me just one little snippet of that, mm -hmm. because when it comes to just looking at the fiscal, and I, and I noticed this when I was giving presentations over the last 10 years, just going right. around showing people the numbers of, of like U.S. fiscal policy, especially if you start throwing in Medicare and whatnot. And with each passing year, it just became more and more like the people looking at it were like, are these numbers right? Well, what? There's no solution to this. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you, but these are the numbers. And and so is one thing that you're saying that number one, it's Europe is, it's not like they're in good shape either. Like they're, oh, they're in trouble. Shape. And then yeah. are you saying among other things, like when we're trying to understand Gee, why, you know, are representatives from NATO not ruling out nuclear strikes on Moscow? As a matter of, you know, why why are they talking like that? Are you saying because partly they realize that they're not stupid either? They have accountants on their payroll and they know we can't mm -hmm. pay this off. And, well, if there's a new major war going on, then maybe the public won't be so mad about us just defaulting on all this stuff. Well, you prep us for war by turning it into a just war. And then mm -hmm. that justifies all the spending. What did we do? We came out of World War II with, what, a 216% debt to GDP ratio? Something like that? It was something enormous, right? I don't think it was that. So, I mean, the, the Europe, maybe, yeah, the U.S. It was it was really high, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't even that high, but it was it was big. It, it was it was. We're enormous. just about it matching big. it now, <laughs> right? Okay, so um, it was it was, and and again, that's a policy. Mm -hmm. That's 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 not a, that's not an accident. We could have fixed this. We could we could easily go back to 2019's fiscal budget. Like it's not hard, right. folks. It's only one point seven trillion dollars, and it's all the it's all the extra money that they've lopped on in the last five years anyway. It's not that much money. Like, I mean, it is money, but most of that money is spent overseas. It wouldn't even affect the domestic economy. Like, I this is one of the things that like drives me crazy. I'm like, do you think we spend more than a trillion dollars a year over, overseas? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you think that maybe the cost of sending that, that money in administrative costs, that's the, 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 the SGNA on that trillion dollars we send overseas in terms of government financing is what, maybe $10 billion or $20 billion. So we have to like, we have to fire those people and we have to absorb them into the labor force. But we cut a trillion dollars out of our deficit. Like you don't think that we can't clean up our balance sheet. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous to think that we can't do this. I'm not saying that we have, that it's an easy fix. It is. It's an app. It's 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 a monstrously difficult fix. It'll take 20, 30 years to do so, and it won't reform itself until there's a crisis period. They're hoping to create a crisis that they can create a new system. 
that leaves them in power as opposed to transferring the power away. I, my argument has very, been very simple in, in, in about the 40,000 foot level. Europe never gave up control over the colonies. And I think that a lot of people in our camp really need to do some soul searching about how, I, I, and this is soul searching that I've personally done. Like, so I'm not asking anybody to do anything that I haven't already had to come to terms with, which is my frustration and my anger at the betrayal of the promise of America, mm -hmm. right, is one thing. And my criticisms of the United States are long, legion, and pointed, and full of vitriol. But that said, you know, we're not the only bad actor in the world. And when you start to really look at the policies, you start to look at the, the things that have been put in place over time, the tax policy, the, it's all come from somewhere else. And it's all come from our old colonial masters in Europe. They never gave up real control. They used their influence within our, you know, within our, our, our society where the capital was concentrated to maintain political and, and at times economic control over the country. And then they use that to fund their own, um, their own you know, rebirth. And that's what you're, that's where we are now. Remember Armstrong makes this point very clear. Europe sent all of its money to the United States before world war II, used it to build out our industrial complex to then build the, the, the military to go back over and fight world war II against Hitler that they provoked. Like, hello, it's still, they, it's still their money. And now they're, what they're doing now is they're like locusts. They go in, they raise a field, they, 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 they destroy it, and then they take the capital back out again. They've done this, the, the mm -hmm. France, Portugal, Spain, the British, they've done it everywhere they've ever gone, these people. And they've taught us how to do it. And so we're just, and we're, so we're guilty of this, don't get me wrong, but we taught it to us. We don't have to continue doing it. We have yeah. the capital base. We have a constitution. We have a legal structure and a tax haven structure and whatnot, tax structure that would allow for that capital that's still sitting overseas to come over here and we can, and, and it can be rebuilt. It won't be as good. It, it'll, I mean, like it, it, it's going to be, it's like at the end of the day, it's like, it's clear that that's what kind of needs to happen here, and that's what's being fought. That's the fight at the big level. So when you analyze, when you go into and look at Ukraine, and you look at you know you look at Israel, Gaza, or Israel, um, really it's Israel, Iran. Um, when you look at this stuff, and then you start thinking about the big game board, about where the collateral is and where the capital is, and who has it and who doesn't, like the game board is really quite simple. I mean, it'll take me another 45 minutes to lay it all out, but it's not that difficult in very broad strokes. And, you know, we're the ones caught in the middle because we've got the industrial might, or we did. We had the military might. Now they want us to use what's left of it in this kind of orgy of violence to ensure that we're destroyed and they aren't. And they're yeah, hoping for a race to the bottom that they can then come out of first. And just to circle back you you mentioned Woodrow Wilson uh I, I know most of our listeners know this but I I was when I was younger and read that William Jennings Bryan was his secretary of state and mm -hmm. resigned because he's saying there's no reason we need to join you know what we now call World War 1 that let the let mm -hmm. the European powers fight this this has nothing to do with us we can totally stay out of it and Wilson is just being unreasonable with his demands against Germany. Like, what do you expect mm -hmm. them to do with her being blockaded and what? And, and he, so anyway, like that's, and that's and, kind and, of unusual. And, and, Can and, you imagine right now if a secretary of state resigns saying our president's dragging us into a European war that we should have no business like that would be pretty provocative. And yet that's what happened. Well, no, we have the secretary of state actually running the government. <laughs> what we have now yeah. is Anthony Blinken running the government, running government policy, while the Pentagon is trying to pull him back and pull us back from the brink. This is the weird thing that we've got going on here. Like, like, like oh, last week, we had we had Lloyd Austin go to Mannheim, Germany, tell Zelensky flat out, "You're not getting any long range missiles from us, and you're not getting any help from us." And the next day, Blinken's on a plane with David Lammy from Keir Starmer's regime in. Junta in 
the, in the UK to go over to Kiev and tell Zelensky, oh, no, 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 it's okay, go do it. Like, it's, guys, the Pentagon doesn't want to fight this. They know they can't fight a war with Russia and win. They know what the escalatory framework is in this. It's a step function from here. It's not gradual, folks. We don't go from little bits of parallel aggression and you hit us here, so we'll hit you over there. And no, no, no. This goes from where we are to nuclear weapons to done. That's it. And they're literally offering us nuclear blackmail and for their more perfect technocratic union. And I'm saying no. And I think there are very powerful people within the United States. And I think Trump represents those people. And I think those people have moved in Trump's corner. And again, listen to Jamie Dimon carefully. Listen to John Solomon at Goldman very carefully. Listen to these people and they'll t- they're telling you what you need to hear. But it's, it's not, it, it, you know, they don't speak a lot. But when they speak, you listen and you, and you can see it. And I think that we're, I think that Trump represents a real shift back to, okay, we're, we're going to take the foundation that's been laid by getting control of monetary policy to get control of political control. We, we've got monetary control over the United States. Davos didn't get it. They, held, they, they, they lost the battle. Powell got a second term. They have political power. Those two things are at odds. Now, we have monetary power. If we can get political power, the United States can turn the corner and we can change the direction of the world without there being a, you know, without there being a war. I don't know that that's capable of happening. There are a lot of people out there that are going to try and make sure that that does not happen. And that's what scares me to half to death. But it's our job, I think, as Austrians, as Misesians, as libertarians, to try and illuminate the, the, the means by which we get from point A to point Z, which is where we want to go. And not just only talk about the end game strategy. We have to get down and dirty with this this stuff. We have to dig in and realize that this is not that this this is a, a big big problem, and we have answers that they um, that they need at this point. And we know they have, it's so interesting we need to learn how to talk to them. And this is part of the reason why I've been doing what I've been doing the way I've been doing it is to figure out how to talk to people in the normal world about these ideas that they only have a, they have some, they have some inkling of, right. But they don't, haven't quite gotten out of the, 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 the simple, the, the, I don't know. I hate to put it, I hate to be like dismissive of it, but it's kind of like, get out, we're at, get out of high school, Austrian economics, and let's get into graduate level stuff. Let's, let's, let us analyze the plumbing system as opposed to, you know, the other guys. Ooh, that would be interesting. Yeah. And that's where, it, that, and that's where I think it gets interesting. Definitely, definitely. Because you imagine the the insights. I think I'm just scratching the surface of it because I'm not even formally trained in any of this stuff. You guys are. Like that's the thing. Like I'm just like I'm just a you know I'm just a, a poo flinging monkey that likes to play board games and is really good at strategic high level analysis. And then I kind of dig in where I need to. But it's all, it's all, it's all very compartmentalized. Yeah. For that, that, well, that's that's why yeah why I wanted to have you on here is just to give people some exposure to your perspective. And again, it's, I think sometimes we get locked into, and I don't know if this is coming through, but sorry, there's uh yeah. lawn work going on right outside my lawn, window. I can, I, can, I can hear it in the background. Yeah. Hey, you know, my, um, my dogs like to, like to make noise yeah. too. So yeah, yeah. I get it. So yeah, that's why I wanted to have you on here just to give people some exposure to your perspective. Cause I know you, a, a lot, I think a lot of U S based Austro libertarian types are very U S centric and their yeah. outlook on things. And it's and so, yeah, just to, to bring in the, the global picture. So just to point people, if they've been intrigued by your uh, short time with us here, Tom, where can they go to read more of your work? Um, uh, you can, I don't publish a lot on the blog recently because I've been so very, very busy trying to keep up with everything else. Um, we do publish all the, po- the Gold Goods and Guns podcasts over on the blog. I, every once in a while, I'll pop in and write an actual public article. But the the main thing that I'm doing now is, of, of course, the monthly newsletter and then uh, the Patreon service, the Patreon slash Gold Goods and Guns, where we do um, this kind of thing. You know, we do strategic analysis and technical analysis of the of the markets twice a week. We do a, a monthly newsletter where we really, really look ahead at what's going on, my, myself and my partner, Dexter White. And, uh, and I also write for Newsmax as well. 
of our ultimate wealth report and, um, you know, banging on some of these same ideas in, in different ways. So there's that. And then, of course, you follow me on Twitter uh, at TFL1728, which is the main way you keep up with me on a daily daily basis because that's where, well, the worst version of me tends to show up. So hopefully, <laughs> that, one kind we hopefully see. that one is entertaining. Yeah. And so that those are your initials, right? TFL is 1728, yeah. was it? Okay, mm-hmm. so there you go. All right, folks. Well, hopefully, yeah, this uh, lawn, these gears are not a metaphor for the, the gears of war that are coming for us, but uh, Tom, it's been great. Thank you for your time and your insights. I appreciate it, Bob. Thank you. It was good, it was good to ca- catch up with you again. Man. Nice catch up with you. I'll see you soon in the Mises event. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.